A very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to welcome uh, Professor Jachit Bagla uh, from Isar Mohali to speak to us this morning. Uh, he'll be speaking on radio astronomy, the cosmic microwave background and cosmology. Uh, these are uh, some of the areas where uh, Professor Bagla has worked very extensively on. Um, he has also worked on a variety of other topics, structure formation, uh, H1 in the early universe, mm -hmm. gravitation lensing. Uh, so just Jeet, over to you. Thanks very much for making the time to speak to us this morning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sekia, uh, for this uh, opportunity to give a talk in uh, ROS. And my sincere apologies again for uh, not being present on, on the earlier occasion on 23rd December when I was originally supposed to give this talk. All right. So I will try to connect up radio astronomy and uh, measurements of cosmic microwave background and then towards the end, talk a little bit about, about uh, cosmology as to where the implications for cosmology are. But the most interesting part over here is uh, essentially how does one go about measuring something which is very faint and which is pretty much the same in all directions and which does not have any sharp spectral features. So this is uh, uh, on, the, on the right, you can see uh, spectrum or rather a bunch of spectra. Uh, you can see a band labeled CMB and you can see a band labeled dust over here rising as you go to higher frequencies and you can see two other bands synchrotron and free free. So this is uh, synchrotron emission from the uh, uh, our own galaxy as well as from other galaxies and uh, free free emission is also from our own galaxy. So synchrotron essentially is when you have uh, extremely energetic electrons which are uh, moving in a magnetic field because they are extremely energetic, highly relativistic. The radiation which comes out from them does not look like the non-relativistic cyclotron which has spectral lines but it, it ends up uh, being a continuous spectrum. Free free emission is uh, energetic electrons, not necessarily relativistic, but energetic electrons, which are uh, whizzing about uh, in the uh, company of ions. So they, they accelerate as they pass an ion and they emit some radiation. And dust of course emits by virtue of being at a finite temperature. What is missing over here, is uh, an additional component which is uh, magnetized dust, but uh, let us not get into that. So one thing to look or uh, notice over here is that uh, cosmic micro background is the dominant source of radiation in the bracket somewhere around 10 gigahertz to about 100 gigahertz. So if you look at any part of the sky, particularly if you look away from our the, the plane of the galaxy, then you are likely to pick up some amount of CMP, except that it is very, very faint. It is uh, not a very bright source. And uh, the best theoretical predictions which were made early on, which was uh, led by Alpher in 1940s, uh, where he predicted that maybe you will have a temperature of around 5 Kelvin. Of course, these were heuristic calculations, and uh, they could have been off by a factor of 10, and nobody would have blamed Alpha, but it's it's interesting that it turned out to be true within a factor of about uh, factor of uh, correct within a factor of two. So this is something which was expected on uh, theoretical grounds, and uh, it was expected not only in the big bang, big bang model but also in other classes of models like the bouncing model of the universe, which some people were considering. So they wanted the bounce to be at a stage where the universe gets compressed to a very small scale and then expands again. And in such universes also, you have prediction of uh, microwave background uh, kind of making an appearance. So there was one set of people who wanted to make good predictions and wanted to go out and try to observe it. And there were other bunch of people who were just doing observations, not necessarily looking for microwave background. The challenge, of course, is uh, as follows. You have learned much about radio astronomy in the last 10 days. And you are aware that a radio telescope, if I have a single dish, it detects signals from all the sources 
in its field of view. And uh, when you want to measure flux, it's often measured in comparison with a bright source. So you look at what you want to study and then you look at a known source with a known flux. And uh, by comparing the voltage, you are able to say something about uh, what the flux from the unknown source or the source of interest to you is. But if I have, if I'm trying to look at something which is very faint and it is almost the same in all directions, then I run into a little bit of a problem because I have no reference. I mean, every, every direction is almost the same. And uh, how can I make an estimate of the spectrum if the spectrum has no sharp features? So you would have heard about uh, observations of continuum and observations of spectral lines, but in both the, uh, the scenarios, you are essentially comparing either the flux from the source at different frequencies, or you are comparing the source, flux from the source with a nearby brighter and calibrated source. So for faint signals, which are almost same from all directions, that technique does not work. And uh, that was essentially the major challenge. And uh, you might say that, well, even if it is a black body radiation, it has a spectral shape. But you have to remember that till recently, all the radio telescopes worked with a, at a given time, they would observe only in a narrow band with the bandwidth being at least one order of magnitude smaller than the frequency. So if you look at GMRT, uh, which, which was set up in 99, uh, uh, the bandwidth was typically 16 megahertz. The observation frequency could be anywhere between 150 megahertz to about 14, 20 megahertz. So you can see that delta lambda by lambda was always much less than 0.1, which means that you were not looking at a large section of the spectrum at the same time. So these were the observational challenges and the discovery was ultimately made by people who were not looking for it, but who were essentially trying to calibrate a radio telescope, the telescope in the picture over here, uh, as best as they could so that, so that they could study faint sources. And in order to study faint sources, they wanted to reduce the noise level or the RMS of uh, the Sentina, and they wanted to characterize it as well as they could. And they found that as compared to the theoretical expectations, the noise level was a little bit higher. They tried various things. Uh, uh, and a large number of different types of measurements. They tried cleaning up uh, pigeon shit from the antenna. They tried uh, many other things, but in the end, they were about to give up when they, uh, before winding up on the project of trying to lower the RMS, they gave a talk on this at uh, Princeton. And uh, luckily for them, there were theorists in the, in the audience who had been thinking about making such measurements and they were doing theoretical calculations. So they were immediately able to alert them that this is an extremely important discovery. So this picture is from the Nobel lecture by uh, Wilson. Spenzias and Wilson were the co-discoverers uh, back in 1964-65. So what did they do? Because they wanted to have uh, uh, a very good estimate of the RMS and have as low an RMS uh, as possible, they decided to use an absolute calibration, which means they were not looking for a comparison source in the sky. Had they done so, they would have never discovered the CMBR. So it was lucky for everyone concerned and for all of us that they were using an absolute calibration. And calibrate of, uh, calibrator, of course, has to be at a very low temperature if you want to compare with signal from very faint sources. And Penzias and Wilson use liquid helium to maintain reference temperature at around 4 Kelvin. So what they did was, uh, uh, so by now you have learned enough radio astronomy to know that uh, after the initial observation, uh, the signal is pushed through low noise amplifiers and uh, it is only then that it becomes measurable. But because these low noise amplifiers may have variations in amplification, you don't try to make an absolute measurement of the voltage straight away. You need to compare it with something. So what Penzias and Wilson did was to set up uh, <coughs> a resistor dipped in uh, liquid helium. 
And uh, as you know, that will give you, uh, and any resistor at a finite temperature will give you a Josephson current. And uh, they were comparing the signal from the telescope with the uh, current from a resistance which was dipped in four Kelvin. And it, the, the recording of the signal was essentially done in a way so that it was switching back and forth between the sky and this resistance at four Kelvin. This allowed them to make an absolute measurement. So this is from their paper. So this is uh, from a time when, when the names of authors were not written at the top, <laughs> they were written at the bottom. And the uh, paper was titled very uh, unassumingly as a measurement of excess tantina temperature at 408 megacycles per second. So that is essentially 4 gigahertz for you. So let us read the abstract. So they are saying measurement of the effective zenith noise temperature of the 20 foot horn reflector antenna, which was made by Crawford, Hogg, and Hunt in 1961 at the Crawford Hill uh, Laboratory uh, at uh, 4080 megacycles per second have yielded a value of about three and a half Kelvin higher than expected. This excess temperature is within the limits of our observations, isotropic, unpolarized, and so on. Another thing which they point out is that this uh, is uh, free from any seasonal variations. So they have made observations over one entire year from July 1964 to April 1965. And a possible explanation for the observed excess noise temperature is given by Dickie, Peebles, Scholl, and Wilkinson in a companion uh, letter. In fact, they, they appear next to each other. The total antenna temperature measured at the zenith is 6.7 Kelvin, out of which 2.3 Kelvin is due to the atmospheric absorption. And then the, due to ohmic lo losses in the antenna and backlobe response is 0 0.9 degrees Kelvin. So 6.7 minus 2.3 and minus 0.9 is what gave them 3.5 degrees Kelvin. Uh, this was the first measurement and it was followed by several other measurements uh, within a year. So you might wonder how they estimated atmospheric absorption. Well, if you, if you model this, the atmosphere as a plain uh, parallel set of slabs, then you can do an analytical calculation and you can derive the, the uh, variation of the atmospheric absorption with the zenith angle. And uh, so on, on the right, you can see a plot. On the right, you can see a plot, uh, a hand-drawn plot. This is also from uh, Wilson's uh, Nobel lecture where they have uh, drawn the expected variation. And uh, in order to show that 2.3 Kelvin fits it well, there are points referring to 2.2 and 2.4 Kelvins at each of the angles. So you can see that uh, uh, the, the curve which they have, the observed curve is nicely bracketed by these two values. And uh, therefore 2.3 Kelvin is a reasonably good estimate of the uh, atmospheric absorption towards the zenith. So this extinction calculation is something which you can do very easily, and it is there in elementary books of astronomy. If you have not come across it, I urge you to look at it. And this also explains why uh, faint sources are not visible typically near the horizon and why they are visible near the zenith. So this applies to what we see with the eye as well. It's exactly the same variation. The same technique was used uh, later to measure the temperature of CMBR to uh, uh, CMBR much more precisely using uh, COBE FIRAS. So COBE is something which we'll encounter in a short while. So it's Cosmic Background Explorer. This was uh, proposed in 1970s and approved and uh, it was put together in early 1980s. There are three instruments on, on, on this uh, satellite. One of them was COBE FIRAS, which is far infrared absolute spectrometer. And it could do absolute measurements because there was a 
reference uh, liquid helium source on the satellite. As the liquid helium source on satellite could not last forever, FIRAS could make observations only for about, I think, two or three years. So again, the way it was uh, structured was that uh, there were uh, detectors and uh, there was sky as well as the uh, reference black body. And they had movable mirrors which would oscillate between the, the, the and beam splitters so that what, the, what was recorded by the detectors was uh, oscillating between the sky and the uh, calibrator. So you, again, one turns a DC measurement into an AC measurement. Uh, this allows you to overcome any short-term or even long-term changes in, in, in the uh, uh, electronics. So the great thing about making measurements from space is that atmospheric effects are not present and hence much better measurements can be made and they can be made over a very wide range of frequencies. So this particular uh, instrument was designed and built by a team led by uh, John Mathair. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize for this effort later on. And over here, you can see the measurement of the spectrum. So unfortunately, now we have switched from frequency to wavelength. And uh, it fits a black body curve very well. You might say that there are no points over here. Actually, there are data points and there are error bars, but the error bars are so small that you cannot see them. Uh, black body spectrum with a temperature of around 2.76 Kelvin fits extremely well over here. But once the discovery was made in 19 and announced in 1965, the immediate question that astronomers raised was, how can it be so isotropic? Because if it is absolutely isotropic, there should be no structures in the universe. So there must be some anisotropy and people wanted to detect it. Nothing was detected for almost a dozen years. And the first detection was announced by George Smoot and uh, company in 1977. They designed a differential radiometer. So you can see the design, the layout of this on the right. There are uh, two sets of antennas at two different frequencies. There is a 54 gigahertz and there is a 33 gigahertz receiver. And you can see that there are uh, antennas, both the sets of antennas are point, uh, there are pairs of them pointing in two different directions, theta one and theta two. Okay. And the electronics at the back was designed so that it would record the difference of flux between antenna one and antenna two. And Sir, then it would, yes. So you told that anisotropy is needed to have uh, structures in universe, but why is it so? Well, if there is no anisotropy in the CMBR, that would mean that in the early universe, there were no fluctuations. If there were no fluctuations in the early universe, then the only fluctuations which could be present in matter would be therm of, of thermal origin. And you can do a quick calculation to show that those fluctuations will be so small that no structure like galaxy should form by today. Okay, sir. Okay. All right, so coming back to sir, this. Uh, sir, you say that anisotropy is important for structures that we see today, but by and large, we consider the whole universe to be isotropic. Yes, the level of anisotropy is small, but it is not zero. So essentially, the amplitude of anisotropies, uh, we need a non-zero amplitude. And we need an amplitude which will, which is large enough that it will lead to formation of galaxies by today. In fact, much before today. As at the same time, we don't want the anisotropies to be so large that they could have been detected without the use of sophisticated instruments. Okay. Yeah. The fact that it required a lot of effort as we are going through this, uh, this discussion shows that the amplitude of anisotropies is small. 
But if the anisotropies were so small that no galaxies could have formed, then we would be in trouble because that would mean that our entire cosmological model is, uh, is not based on uh, sound first principles or assumptions. So then we'll have to revisit that. Okay, so let me see if I can get this. So we have one antenna pointing in this direction, another antenna pointing in this direction. So these are 33 gigahertz receiver. And uh, I have the 54 gigahertz receivers pointing in the same direction. So this is 54 gigahertz. And the way the system works is that uh, the uh, receiver at the back records not signal from theta 1 and signal from theta 2, but it records the difference. And then it switches and records the difference of theta 2 and theta 1. This again makes the measurement into an alternating one. And it puts the reference essentially on the sky. But in order to have the reference on the sky and have it uh, and have it be a reliable uh, reference, I have to make sure that each point on the sky is visited many, many times so that I have enough redundancy so, uh, and repeated measurements to be able to rely on that. So this, this uh, particular instrument was designed and flown in a balloon and, uh, uh, sorry, not in a balloon, but in a, an aircraft and measurements were made. And uh, so this, this design is, uh, was originally because of uh, Robert Henry Dickey. Uh, and uh, what they managed to do was to show that uh, there is a special direction in the sky where the temperature of CMB is highest and uh, then when I plot the delta T as an angle from this direction, the delta T has a sinusoidal kind of a variation or a cosine variation to be uh, precise. The amplitude seems to be around three millikelvins over here. So if you read the abstract on the right, it shows, it says that uh, the observation is readily interpreted as due to motion of the earth relative to the CMB background with a velocity of 390 plus minus 60 kilometers per second. So what they say is that essentially this is a measurement of the observer through the frame of reference defined by the cosmic microwave background and the velocity is close to 400 kilometers per second. So that, of course, requires an understanding. Uh, as you know, Earth moves around the sun with an instantaneous speed of around 30 kilometers per second. Sun is going around the center of the galaxy with a speed of around 220 kilometers per second. And they, they, these two need not be co-aligned. They can be in different directions. So the residual must come from the motion of the Milky Way, our galaxy, in the background of cosmic microwave background radiation. So this was the first anisotropy, but one has to understand that this is not intrinsic to CMB. CMB can still be interpreted to be absolutely isotropic and uniform at this level. And whatever we are seeing is an artifact because we are moving through space. Uh, we are moving through the frame of reference of cosmic microwave background radiation. So the next major step, uh, I'm jumping a few minor steps, but the next major step was uh, designing the Cosmic Background Explorer. And uh, the target was to make measurements of the kind which were being made from aircraft or balloons, uh, do this from the sky, do this uh, above the atmosphere, and uh, do it all sky, because when you make measurements from the Earth, all sky measurements are not possible. And... Uh, uh, by doing it above the atmosphere, one has access to, potentially has access to more frequencies 
than we can observe from the ground. So that, that was the target. And uh, the proposal was made soon after uh, Smoot published the observation of uh, dipole anisotropy. Unfortunately, uh, the COBE uh, launch was stalled because of the shuttle crash. So it was to be launched on uh, space shuttle in uh, mid 1980s. But because of the shuttle crash, all the launches were uh, held back for some time and then postponed. And finally, it got launched only in 1990. So the uh, orbit was designed to be a sun-synchronous polar orbit so that the satellite is always looking away from the sun, okay? Not away from the sun, but looking in a direction which is perpendicular to the sun. However, in this way, it cannot avoid looking at the moon once in a while and Jupiter once in a while, and these are bright sources in the sky. And in the end, of course, they had to remove uh, whenever either of these objects was in the field of view. So you remove that part of data and uh, use the rest. And it, it was to view each part of the sky many times for redundancy. In fact, it, it completed a full survey of the sky once in about 12 hours. And uh, it continued making observations for a period of four years. So you can see that uh, it, it observed each part of the sky at least uh, 2,400 times. So we already talk, talked about one of the instruments on board COBE, which was uh, far infrared absolute spectrometer. Now we come to the differential uh, microwave radiometer. This is essentially built on the same uh, Dickey radiometer design, where you have uh, two antennas and uh, you, you switch between them to make measurements. So you record T1 minus T2 and T2 minus T1 successively in order to overcome any variations in the backhand electronics. Uh, unlike Smoot's instrument, which used two frequencies, this one used three different frequency bands in order to uh, enable subtraction of uh, foreground sources. So if I may go back to my almost my first slide. So you can see that when I look at the sky, I will have not only CMB, but I'll have dust, I'll have synchrotron, I'll have free free. So by making observations of each part of the sky at three different frequencies, it is possible to try to fit and remove the foregrounds due to dust, synchrotron, and free free. So that was the aim. That was the reason why Kobe used three different frequencies for observations. And of course, Kobe's successors, which we will talk about in a short while, made use of many more than uh, three, three uh, bands for observations. So uh, it, of course, improved measurement of the dipole immediately. Uh, this uh, was done within a period of a few weeks and improved by the end of four years. It uh, made a measurement of the dipole down to the uh, 10 mic micro Kelvin uh, kind of a level. So we know the CMB temperature is 2.76 Kelvin. Uh, the dipole is 3.353 milli Kelvin. So it gives us a very good estimate of the speed of the observer through the CMB frame. And you can see that one part of the sky looks brighter, the other part looks fainter. In between, we have a few blobs in the equatorial plane. Uh, this is in galactic coordinates, so essentially these are galactic sources which are corrupting uh, the picture. So when quantitative analysis is done, typically data in the plane of the galaxy is kept aside and not analyzed, and rest of the sky is analyzed. I should add that uh, the same dipole can also be observed, uh, can be detected from the data of uh, far infrared uh, radio, uh, absolute spectrometer or FIRAS because FIRAS gives you a measurement of temperature in uh, each direction of the sky. Uh, this analysis is not very hard. In fact, a uh, few years ago, a bunch of uh, first year students in our BSMS program, they took it up as a summer project and they reproduced uh, all the measurements, all the analysis uh, done by the FIRAS team. And uh, they in fact wrote a, a bunch of Python scripts so that it becomes a, a 
a, a little bit of uh, exercise which students, undergraduate students can do uh, along with a cosmology or an astronomy course. So they were able to reproduce this measurement uh, by, by analyzing FIRAS data. FIRAS data because it is essentially given in terms of temperature of the sky in each direction is much simpler to analyze than DMR data, which is uh, layered because it covers every part of the sky uh, a large number of times. And these are uh, and those are all differential measurements because you are looking at the, the antenna was looking at two different directions. The telescopes were looking at two different directions and you have to combine both of those, uh, subtract one from the other uh, before uh, uh, recording the measurement. So going beyond the dipole, uh, Kobe was able to make the first reliable measurement of uh, anisotropies. Uh, so over here, what has been done? So in this map, what has been done is that you have taken the CMB measurement all over the sky and subtracted the average CMB temperature of 2.76 Kelvin. When you subtract the dipole fit, what remains is this. And now you can see that the scale has become uh, uh, very different. We are talking about a delta T of 18 micro Kelvin. So this Hashini maybe answers your question. Anisotropies are there, but they are extremely tiny. We are talking about 18 micro Kelvins at large scales in uh, uh, average temperature of close to 3 Kelvin. In the middle, of course, you see the galaxy, the red band, uh, which is very, very bright. But away from the galactic plane, you, uh, you can see that there are regions which are cooler, which are bluer and darker, and there are regions which are slightly hotter, which are uh, reds and yellows. Green is kind of uh, average over here. I should mention that the first hint of uh, measurement of anisotropies was made about a year before COBE was launched. This was done by launching very similar radiometers on board a high altitude balloon by a team of astronomers at MIT, except that they could cover only half the sky and they could uh, make observations only over a month or so. And therefore the, the, uh, the reliability of measurement was not very great. In terms of uh, RMS uh, sigma, their their detection was not even one sigma. Yeah, what oh. does the, the green regions indicate? Uh, green and all is basically all of these are color coding. Green is close to average temperature of CMB. Okay, and since the red region, region seems to be lie in that equatorial plane or so. That is the uh, radiation from that is the radiation from the galaxy. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so once Kobe had made the measurement, uh, it actually revolutionized cosmology in a way because the level of anisotropies which were, was expected in the model which was popular at that time was uh, lower than what was found to be, essentially meaning that at very large scales, the amplitude of anisotropies was a little bit higher. And this led to the push uh, away from the standard cold dark matter model. Uh, and we essentially ended up a few years later in a model which has a cosmological constant and a late time acceleration in order to fit all the observations together as a nice uh, jigsaw puzzle. So a large number of experiments have been done to make measurements of CMBR anisotropies, some from Earth, some from balloon borne instruments, and some from space. From the Earth, there are uh, radiometers, there are absolute measurements, as well as interferometric measurements that have been done. And uh, they all have contributed an immense amount to our understanding of CMBR. Space-based observations have the uh, advantage that they can cover the entire sky without having to deal with the atmosphere. So once COBE measurements came in, the same team uh, proposed that we now, used, uh, now use uh, better quality uh, detectors, which were already available at that time, mainly because COBE had, launch had been delayed and uh, launch another satellite with similar uh, design. So this was Wilkinson uh, Microwave Anisotropy Probe. 
which was launched in uh, 2000. And uh, later on, uh, the European Space Agency launched a mission called Planck, which went an order of magnitude further in resolution and was placed at uh, L2 in the Earth-Sun system for improved sensitivity and avoidance of both the moon and the sun. So I will skip all the intermediate things and tell you about what we know at uh, present. So the best data we have comes from the Planck mission. And uh, Planck observed in nine bands over uh, 10 gigahertz to 900 gigahertz. It was originally, actually, there were two independent proposals which were made to European Space Agency in uh, early 1990s. One was called COBRAS, the other was called SAMBA. And uh, European Space Agency asked them to combine the proposals. So originally it was called Cobra Samba, and then later on they added Planck's name to it. Uh, it took, so the high frequency detectors, which are closer to 900 gigahertz, they are helium cooled for improved sensitivity. And it takes took two decades to develop and launch this instrument. So in between 2010 and 2012, uh, data was collected over 18 months. It could not be pushed much further, mainly because liquid helium ran out. It's taken nearly 10 years to fully analyze the data collected in those 18 months. And the latest release of analysis was uh, done uh, only, only this year. So this is the Planck CMB map. This is from the ESA Planck uh, archive. And you can see how fine it is, what a high resolution we have now. And uh, notice that we are actually able to subtract out the galaxy quite impressively, mainly on the back of nine independent frequency receivers, which are there. So what is done is that for each pixel in the map, you have measurements of flux at nine different frequencies. And then you try to fit and uh, separate out a black body radiation from uh, emission due to dust, emission due to synchrotron, emission due to free free, and so on. And after doing that component separation, what you retain is only the CMB. And that is what is plotted over here. You can see that the variation from highest to lowest is about 300 microkelvins or 0.3 millikelvins. So the most extreme variations in anisotropies are a factor of 10 lower than dipole. So why is it that COBE did not see things at this level? Why was the COBE map plus minus 18 microkelvin? The answer lies in looking at the anisotropy spectrum. So what is done is that you first make a sky map of temperature fluctuations, and then you expand it in terms of spherical harmonics, many of you would have studied this in uh, mathematical methods. You would have studied uh, Legendre polynomials and associated uh, spherical harmonics. So those are the ap uh, appropriate basis for studying things on the sky. And uh, so just like we have Fourier transforms uh, corresponding to Cartesian coordinates, we can do a spherical transform corresponding to spherical harmonics. And the uh, relevant variables over there are L and M. And the power spectrum is then calculated in terms of uh, the multipole L, which is inverse of the angular separation and compared with theory. So essentially what is being done is uh, that we are taking temperature at in one direction of this on the sky and temperature in another direction on the sky separated by a given angle theta and then we are averaging over this product over the entire sky. Let me switch to uh, tape light. Yeah. So I have temperature in direction theta one. I have temperature in direction theta two. And I average it over the entire sky such that theta one minus theta two is equal to some angle psi. So this is theta one, 
this is theta 2. This angle is psi. And of course, this is just one pair of points. But what this averaging means is that I do the same for all points on the sky. Okay. Now, this in itself is not very useful because it also has the average temperature at both the points. So I can define it by writing delta T1, delta T2, and then doing the average. So T at theta 1 gives me delta T1, T at theta 2 gives me delta T2, and then I do the averaging. The average of delta T1 or delta T2 would have been 0 when done over all the sky, but this product itself need not be 0. So this would have given me a correlation in temperature on the sky. And the spherical transform, so this would have been a function of theta, the psi, angle psi. And I can do a transform into spherical uh, coordinates. L is basically like 180 degrees by psi measured in degrees. And then in terms of spherical harmonics, I can look at this correlation in terms of the analogous power spectrum. So this is that power spectrum, which is plotted as a function of multipole L. Kobe was sensitive to only very large scales because the antennas on board Kobe had a field of view of around seven degrees. So it could only make measurements in this part only at low multipoles because it could it was sensitive only to high uh, large values of theta. WMAP, on the other hand, could make reliable measurements up to this point. So this is Kobe. This is WMAP. And you can see that at L's corresponding to this particular scale, <coughs> excuse me, the power spectrum is very high. So once you get to this scale, you are able to see larger anisotropies than you can at very, very large scales. So the power spectrum is off by, increases by a factor of more than five between these two. So Planck, of course, is able to go all the way. And uh, the line which is running through these points is the best fit model with the cosmological constant. These peaks which you see, this one, this one, this one, and so on, these are called baryon acoustic peaks or BAO for short. And these form because the matter, normal matter atoms, uh, which are at that stage in the early universe in a plasma form, are very tightly coupled with photons in the cosmic microwave background radiation or radiation background in the early universe. So they move together <coughs> and it is their combined effect which leads to this oscillatory behavior. The presence of third and fourth and fifth peak indicates that there was something pulling back and that is a very strong proof of presence of dark matter in the universe. Okay, so this particular curve which I have shown you here is extremely rich in information and it has evolutionized cosmology. We will not go into that because the focus for you is primarily in radio astronomy, but I wanted to at least mention as to why these things are uh, very relevant. So as I was saying earlier, dark matter. Can you please repeat? Yeah. So the third and third uh, peak in the curve onwards, all the peaks are indicative that there is a restoring force in the universe, which is trying to keep these oscillations going because these oscillations are expected to damp out. So unless there is some forcing, you will not have uh, higher the third or fourth or fifth peak. So in order to fit the data, you have to assume presence of dark matter, which is not coupled with electromagnetic radiation in any way whatsoever. Normal matter, of course, couples because photons can ionize atoms. Photons can scatter off electrons. 
Okay, so there is a strong coupling between normal matter and radiation, and the peaks are a result of that. But that is not the whole story because the structure of peaks would have been very different if some matter which does not couple with electromagnetic radiation was not present. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, and what is the x-axis here? What does it represent? X-axis is multipole L, uh, which I wrote down. So this is uh, L, which is like 180 degrees by angle psi, which I wrote down on the previous slide. Okay, and that's multipole? That is multipole. Multipole, okay. And you can see that it peaks close to 200. So it peaks close to a scale of roughly one degree. Right. All right. Sir, is the bottom curve, uh, the top curve minus the average? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, the curve at the bottom, uh, the, in the lower panel, is that the upper panel curve minus the average? No, that is not the upper curve minus the average. That actually is a correlation between the variation in temperature and polarization. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll not get into that right now. That also contains a lot of information. All right, so power spectrum is calculated compared with theory. And this exercise of calculating the power spectrum from observations scales as a very high power of the number of pixels in the map. And that is why it has taken a long time to, uh, uh, a long time to uh, analyze the Planck data. In fact, it has taken close to 10 years to complete the analysis, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, CMBR observations allow us to test the cosmological model and CMBR and isotropies are seeds that grow into uh, uh, galaxies and large scale structures that we see, that we live in. And small amplitude of anisotropies when CMB formed, that allows for easier theoretical calculations, reducing uncertainties. And this has improved our estimation of cosmological parameters by more than an order of magnitude in the last three decades. So when I started my PhD roughly 30 years ago, at that stage, the Hubble's constant uh, was, uh, when we didn't know what its value was, we knew that it has to be between 40 and 110 units being uh, kilometers per second per megaparsecs. So today people are fighting whether it is 67 or 72, uh, and both the groups saying that the other observation has an error. So you can see the level of improvement. 30 years ago, we did not know what the total matter content of the universe was. Most people, most theorists, liked to believe that uh, the universe is made up entirely of matter, of non-relativistic matter, primarily because it gave you a very beautiful uh, model. Now we know that the uh, non-relativistic matter contributes only around 30%, rest 70% being uh, cosmological constant with a small contribution from radiation and relativistic matter and so on. We know about the spectrum of fluctuations, which we had absolutely no clue about 30 years ago. So all of this, this has improved our estimation of cosmological parameters by more than an order of magnitude in the last three decades. What lies ahead? Well, in future, of course, one has to do uh, better observations. And uh, one direction in which a lot of effort is being made is to make observations of the spectrum but do much, 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 much better than what Firas did so that we can not only measure the temperature better, but we can spot any deviations from uh, constant uh, black body, uh, constant temperature black body. What this will tell us is about the details of the constitution of the universe in the, uh, at, at that time, because ultimately the, all the photons which are emitted a bulk of them are emitted as line emission or continuum emission from specific uh, processes. And uh, if there is any line emission, that will lead to a deviation from the blackbody spectrum. We should see a spectral line 
riding on top of the black body spectrum. These are not easy to see because the total number of uh, atoms in the universe is less than a billionth of the total number of photons in the universe, which means any imprint because of atoms is diluted. It is diluted further because when we look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, we don't see an instant in the history of the universe, but it is extended. We, we, have, we are observing uh, photons from a wide variety of redshifts with the width in redshift space and hence in the frequency space being roughly uh, a 20th of the frequency. So all the spectral lines which get imprinted will have a very, very broad kind of a behavior. So that is a major challenge. A number of efforts are being made, including those from uh, India, from uh, Raman Research Institute. I think you can catch Desh and he can tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, those are the directions in which uh, these measurements are moving. And CMBR studies continue to be at the cutting edge of uh, radio astronomy, particularly high frequency radio astronomy. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thanks, Jajit, very much for a great lucid talk. Um, so please unmute yourself and feel free to ask. If there are too many, you can put your hands up, but otherwise just unmute and ask. Sir, could you please go back to the power spectrum slide? Yes. Um, sir, if I am not mistaken, the uh, peaks seem to be somewhat um, close, like, so this seems to be some sort of a periodicity. Yes, they are harmonics. Oh, I see. So uh, what is the like, physical significance of this? Well, if you want to go into detail, uh, as the universe expands and fluctuations at different scales uh, become causally connected, they behave uh, differently in the early universe when radiation dominates because radiation provides a lot of pressure and that pressure does not let any fluctuations collapse. So essentially, any fluctuation which enters uh, become causally connected, it goes into an oscillatory behavior. So because it's because of those oscillations that you have harmonics. Yes, So what's the issue with helium as a reference point? Like uh, we can't keep it going for some few more years. What is... say, say that again. Uh, what's the issue with taking helium as the uh, reference point? Like you said, it does not allow you to take observation for more than a couple of years. Oh, it, it evaporates. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Anything that can go past that hurdle? Any other material maybe? Not really. Liquid helium, helium-4 is the most stable one. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, if it is in space, you cannot replenish it. And uh, Planck, of course, was uh, not even in an orbit around the Earth. It was at the Lagrange point. So very little hope of being able to send uh, a devar with uh, some more liquid helium. So. And it's in space, so you cannot recycle it easily. What happens in terrestrial labs, so if, if you go to any low temperature physics lab where they use liquid helium. There again, helium does evaporate, but what they do is they set up a system so that uh, evaporating helium can be trapped and cooled again. And uh, then it, it can be recycled, but in space that is not possible. Okay. So there's a question on chat. What is the lowest frequency that is measured for CMB? So I think Planck measurements at 10 gigahertz may be the lowest ones. I think 10 gigahertz is roughly the lowest. Okay, any other right. questions? Uh, yeah. So uh, there's a discrepancy between the uh, NSA to be measured by OB and by Planck. So you said that was explained by the uh, spectrum curve. So could you uh, like give more details regarding that? I think, uh, I didn't understand yeah, so Kobe was able to measure uh, anisotropies at uh, multipoles, which are uh, about 20 and lower. Okay, and you can see that at low L, the amplitude of anisotropies is smaller. And as you get to a multipole of around 200, the amplitude of anisotropies is much higher. 
that is the explanation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if you have high resolution, you can see this part. If you don't have high resolution, you cannot see this part. The full width at half maximum for the Kobe antennas was seven degrees, whereas uh, this big peak occurs at one degree. So essentially, Kobe was averaging everything out over a seven degree scale. Uh, what was the reason that normal calibration was not uh, useful for CMB measurements? I did not understand. Well, the signal itself is so weak that uh, you don't have any other known source, uh, reliable source in the sky to which you can calibrate. See, when you, you've been working, uh, you, you've been looking at uh, various radio astronomy things. What is the antenna temperatures that you came across? You would have looked at numbers for GMRT. You would have looked at uh, some toy antennas which are there. Yeah. So those numbers are in tens of kelvins. Whereas here the measurement has to be made for something which is uh, in a few kelvin. So in order to make observation for something which is a few kelvin, you need to calibrate it with something which is also at a temperature of a few kelvin. And you need reliability. So if I have evaporating liquid helium, then I know that the temperature will be 4 Kelvin. Just like when I have boiling water, I know that the temperature will be 100 degrees Celsius if it is at uh, sea level. So it gives me a stable and a nearby calibrator. Not very far away from what I'm measuring. Yeah, love it. Go on. Yeah, okay. So uh, because I was thinking that we see faint sources every time, like that is the problem that many sources are faint. But that measurement is not reliable, is what you meant. That, that, no, no, that's see, why we need. If I am seeing a source, let's say I have a point source. Okay. I can see what happens as the point source goes across uh, my field of view because of rotation of Earth. But in case of CMB, I cannot do that because one part of CMB goes away, another part comes in, and they are almost the same. Yeah. 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 So here I need a different kind of an approach. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sir, uh, uh, in the Kobe, uh, I mean, th that thing, it was uh, mentioned that uh, it could not avoid Moon, Jupiter, and other things. So it was basically, uh, I mean, when the data was taken, it was kind of subtracted and all. So uh, why was it so? I mean, uh, what was the problem if there was something in between? I didn't get that part. Because Moon and Jupiter were much, much brighter than CMBR. So if they are in the field of view, then your observation is not reliable. Uh, but in that sense, like, won't there be many other sources as well? Like the uh, sky might be having many sources, right, which are uh, too bright. So uh, other sources are not moving in the sky. Moon and Jupiter will appear at different parts of the sky every time. Oh, okay, okay, uh, yeah, got it. Yeah. 